Hi, welcome to the twelfth rule of acquisition. Math is a superset of nature. And there's a lot of sub rules here, and we'll cover those as we go along. I've heard a lot of people, especially physicists on mainstream uh, news, say that math is the language of physics, and there's all kinds of symbology. And there's a lot of people, especially coming out of college, that almost feel like that they've been taught some alchemy language where if they just get the mathematical incantations right then nature will obey your wishes just like Harry Potter. And there's also those that believe that as long as you follow the mathematical rules that the outcome of a derivation involving scientific models must therefore be true. Let's see about that. Let's first look at the difference between mathematics and nature. In mathematics you can define and describe a system of over unity. In physics and nature, you don't get that. In mathematics, you can define a world of infinite dimensions and even fractional dimensions. But scientists believe that the real universe is somewhere between 11 and 12 dimensions, depending on you know, which theory du jour. In mathematics, you have infinity. In nature, we, well, we, the, in, the universe might be infinite, but we've never really observed it. So we don't really know for sure. In mathematics, you can describe a system as either continuous or discrete. But in nature, we kind of think everything quantized by charge, um, whatever. In mathematics, you can describe waves that propagate instantaneously. In physics, you don't ever have instantaneous propagation. And in mathematics, you can describe um, over unity uh, and, and all kinds, but in nature, energy is conserved. In, in mathematics, it doesn't have to be. And so, basically, in mathematics, you can describe anything that your imagination can dream up, okay? But everything you can dream up doesn't happen in nature. Okay, so mathematics can follow your wishes and your dreams and your desires, and you can create whatever magical world you want. In physics, eh, you've got limits. You can, only, you can only dream up what you can manipulate. You can only manipulate what you can manipulate. And that's as far as your dreams are going to carry you in the real world. And therefore, we come to the ultimate conclusion that mathematics is a superset of nature. Because you can describe more in mathematics than what actually occurs in the real world. And let me give you the case of intrinsic inductance. In one of the earlier videos, in every textbook, there is a derivation for intrinsic inductance. And we showed in the foundation series that that derivation is completely bogus. It ends up deriving a value for a linear wire where the inductance per unit length is actually less than that of free space. And am I like the only guy in the world that says, wait a minute, how can you have an inductance of a wire that's less than the inductance of free space? It doesn't make any sense. Oh, but that's been in the derivation is true. It followed all the rules of mathematics perfectly but they made an error in their application. Simple as that. So, just because you can follow the rules of mathematics doesn't mean that what you derive is true. And in fact, what they derived was not re re is not reality in terms of physics. Uh, rule of acquisition 12a, derivations are not proof. Because it's possible to describe things mathematically that do not exist in the real world, we can't trust any mathematical derivation until it's verified by observation. I use verified loosely because people assume when you verify it, it's true. All you're doing is taking an observation that agrees with a theory or a derivation. It doesn't mean the theory or derivation is true. Now, there are lower risks for interpolation as opposed to extrapolation. So what's that mean? Well, if you have measured data like this, then if you look to the points in between where you measured, you're probably going to be pretty good that you're going to get the right answer unless nature's doing something like this to you. But on the other hand, if you're trying to extrapolate beyond your measured data, that's what extrapolation is, things are a little more problematic. Now I'm going to make a distinction between mathematical proofs here because what we're, this whole series is the rule of acquisitions for the rules of scientific acquisition. Okay, you can have mathematical proofs in mathematics because we humans define the entire system and the rules and the assumptions. So you can have mathematical proof among mathematics, but not 
have mathematical proofs that derive anything in reality and in nature. Because mathematics, is, we're just trying to mimic nature with mathematics. It doesn't mean that nature has to follow mathematics. And here's an example. Number two. In the 1800s, scientists derived the age of the sun, believing it was a giant ball of burning coal. And they derived that age of the sun to be about 6,000 years old. And because their derivation matched the biblical account of the age of the universe, it was believed to be true, at least for a while, until people started wondering, well, where's all the smoke? You know, Earth should have passed through a plume of smoke somewhere along the year, depending on which way the wind in the universe is blowing. Okay, and this leads to uh, rule of acquisition 12b. Math requires constraints. And that, again, we're talking in terms of math applied to science. So in my definition of science, the only valid use of the word law is a rule that constrains mathematics to nature. For example, conservation of energy laws, Kirchhoff's voltage law, which is really a conservative field law, no over unity, no perpetual motion, and Distinti's law of empirical conservation, which will be described a few pages hence. And one thing we have to remember as scientists is that empirical models are the foundation of science. And the way I'm going to ex explain this to you is to use an example of trying to paint a wall. So you say you're going to paint a wall. Well, how do you determine how much paint to order? Well, what you do is you get your tape measure out and you measure the, the square area of the wall. Okay, and that's an empirical measurement right there. We're already starting with an empirical measurement. But it's based on an arbitrary of rule of what a unit of length is. And the can of paint on the side is going to tell you that, well, this, pal this can of paint, this type of paint can cover 250 to 400 square feet per gallon. But where does this number come from? It's not a mathematical derivation. It wasn't handed to us by God on stone tablets. No. At the paint manufacturing company, they sent poor, some, old, some poor old slob out with a paint bucket and a brush and probably laid out a whole bunch of sheetrock on the ground and said, keep on painting until you run out of paint. And then we're going to figure out how much square area that gallon of paint covered. So it's as simple as somebody making another mathematic, another empirical measurement. So basically, mathematics is simply an extension of our ability to mimic. Because when you go and paint your wall, you're basically mimicking what some poor slob at the paint company did. But you're going to use mathematics to scale up or down your project based on his empirical measurement. So all we're doing is using mathematics to mimic what has already been done. Okay, now, that's not always the case because math also allows you to infer and extrapolate other possibilities by applying assumptions and theories to existing th empirical models. However, these new extra empirical predictions must be observed in order to bring them back to an empirical basis. So therefore, even though we may use math to, or in logic and reason to extrapolate beyond what empirical models we have to see where these things may line up to give us another point of interest in the universe, we still have to go there and measure it to verify that it's true. By measuring it, we bring this new information back down to an empirical basis. And therefore, science should always have empirical models. Always. Even though we may use math to extend and extrapolate, we must always bring it back to an empirical measurement. Okay, and therefore, 12D derivations require empiricalization. That's a word I, I came up with, which basically means you have to go and measure it and bring it back to an empirical model. So derivations cannot exist on their own, not in science. They have, eventually have to be empiricalized and be brought back down to being just an empirical model. And that's what we should only, only use for science going forward. That's the only thing engineers will use. You cannot use models about things we've never seen unless the results of those models have been verified. But just because you can verify something doesn't mean that the underlying theory or assumption is true. Okay, so in other words, if we use something involving dark matter and it gives us a result that's good, that's great, but that doesn't mean dark matter exists. And just because we can do models using the ether and we get the right answers does not mean the ether really exists until we actually directly observe the ether. So we have to be careful. These, these 
theories and abstractions may not really be there, but they may actually give us good results. So we have to be careful of what we assume to be true. And another example is like quantum electrodynamics. Quantum electrodynamics gets the right answer by assuming charges from the future come back to the past and balance out all the equations. Well, that doesn't mean it's true. It just means that we get the right answer. But until we actually observe those charges coming back from the future, that we can't trust those to be real. But we can still use the models because they give us the right results, but that doesn't mean charges that in fact do come back from the future. So we have to be careful that empiricalization does not prove the theories or assumptions that went into empiricalizing the models. So here's Distinti's law of empirical conservation. A derivation that doesn't have assumptions, in other words, we're deriving just on pure empirical models, cannot predict more or less effects than the empirical models from which it was based. If it does, then either an error or an assumption was introduced somewhere along the way. And let me give you an example of vector magnetic potentials. When I was initially going into looking into induction 20 years ago, somebody said to me, oh, well, then we can easily solve all that with vector magnetic potentials. And I looked, and I'm like, wait a minute, vector magnetic potentials is derived from Faraday's and the other law, the magnetic field laws, models. How can it predict more? And the guy's, oh, uh, 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 uh. so we got to not, if we're getting more out of something than we put in, that's like over unity with mathematical models. We have to be careful. If we're getting more out than we put in, then we've done something wrong somewhere. Okay, so let's be careful. Mathematics is simply a tool that enables us to mimic, extend, and scale our observations, our empirical models. Mathematics is not magic or voodoo. Demons are not going to arise if you subtract 666 from 8400. That's a little puzzle to see if you can figure out what, what, what that gives you. And finally, like anything else man has invented, math is garbage in, garbage out, with a retarded monkey operator who foolishly believes that following the rules of math is sufficient to produce irrefutable results. Thank you very much.